Not all lawyers are good. I cannot emphasize this enough. And not all lawsuits are well stated. That is doubly true. And while you have a constitutional right to a jury trial, I have a First Amendment right to make fun of you mercilessly in front of millions of subscribers. <laughs> Now, in fairness, frivolous lawsuits are often brought by self-represented individuals who are unable to find a lawyer to take their crazy cases. But sometimes there are actual attorneys who are willing to attach their names and reputations to the lawsuits that we're going to destroy today. So let's start with the case of the candy box that has too much air in it. A time-honored tradition of going to the movies is buying movie candy. And one of the more popular movie candies for inexplicable reasons is Junior Mints, uh, the candy that tastes like you just went to the dentist's office. Now, if you've ever picked up a box of Junior Mints, you might have noticed that the box is not exactly filled to the top with candy. For many, this is an irritating example of shrinkflation, where companies downsize the size or quantity of the product that you receive while charging the same amount of money. And if you've ever gone to a movie theater, you're being charged way, way too much for basically mint flavored wax. But for New York City resident Biola Daniel, the air in the Junior Mint's package was an egregious fraud perpetrated upon the American public. And for that injustice, Miss Daniel and her lawyers decided to take a stand for consumers everywhere. So in 2017, Miss Daniel finally a class action lawsuit against Tootsie Roll Industries, the parent company of Junior Mints, claiming the manufacturer intentionally tricks customers by packaging their candies in unexpectedly large boxes topped with too much air, referred to in the complaint as Slackville. So as I move this up and down, it's gonna pump air out of the jar. Abel Duran of New York and Trakila Perkins of Mississippi would later join the lawsuit as class plaintiffs. According to the 36 page complaint, Miss Daniel purchased a 3.5 ounce box of Junior Mints from a local pharmacy for $1.49. Sense. Ms. Daniel complained that the box, quote, contained approximately 40% non functional slack fill, while competitor candies like Milk Duds and Good and Plenty only contain 23 and 12% slack fill, respectively, in addition to those candies actually being something a human should consume. Uh, the complaint said, quote, the size of the product's boxes in comparison to the volume of the candy contained therein makes it appear to plaintiff and class members that they are buying more than what is actually being sold. Plaintiff and class members are denied the benefit of their bargain because they pay for a full box of the product, but actually received far less. But U.S. District Judge Naomi Reese Buckwald disagreed, tossing the complaint 10 months later. In her 44-page ruling dripping with shade, Judge Buckwald determined that there was no fraud in Junior Mint's packaging and ripped the plaintiffs for claiming that they had been intentionally deceived by Slackville. The judge argued that there was no deception because reasonable consumers of ordinary intelligence could have determined the amount of the candies from reading the box. Quote, the law simply does not provide the level of coddling the plaintiffs seek, assuming that a reasonable consumer might ignore the evidence plainly before him attributes to consumers a level of stupidity that the court cannot countenance. And according to Reuters, hundreds of slack fill lawsuits have been filed in recent years. And in the last decade alone, Tootsie Roll LLC has faced five separate lawsuits over air in its candy boxes, with judges in California, New York, Illinois, and New Jersey all dismissing these cases. Now, to be fair to the class plaintiffs here, it's not impossible to win these lawsuits. According to the FDA, a container that does not allow the consumer to fully view its contents shall be considered to be filled as to be misleading if it contains non-functional slack fill. Slack fill is the difference between the actual capacity of the container and the volume of product contained therein. And the slack fill is non-functional if it is filled to less than capacity for reasons other than one, the protection of the contents of the package, two, the requirements of the machines used for enclosing the contents in such package, three, unavoidable product settling during shipping and handling, four, the need for the package to perform a specific function, five, the fact that the product consists of a food packaged in a reusable container, or six, the inability to increase level of fill or to further reduce the size of of the package. But under these circumstances, it looks like these judges have determined that slack fill lawsuits are full of hot air. Get it? Am I right? Okay, fine. Boo me for my amazing puns. I can hear you through the computer. But that takes us to the Minnesota magician who sued David Copperfield and David Blaine for stealing his godly powers. Now you've probably heard the oft-repeated axiom that people who choose to represent themselves in court, well, you know, they have a fool for a client. But enter Christopher Roller, a Minnesota magician who decided that he would also be that fool by repeatedly suing famous magician David Copperfield for millions of dollars. 
On what grounds, you may ask? Why, for stealing Roller's godlike magician powers without just compensation. Obviously. Now, the saga began in March of 2005, when Roller sued David Copperfield in Minnesota federal court. Quote, David Copperfield has been using my godly powers to perform his magic. The complaint begins before directing the court to his website, so it may witness Roller's, quote, journey to godliness. Citing UFO videos as proof that godly powers exist on Earth, Roller argues that magicians, including Copperfield, quote, have also been granted godly powers by me, somehow, but they have been keeping it a secret and keeping the credits from me. Roller, who claims he's been secretly filmed for decades, uh, all of the Truman Show, Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. is an avid conspiracy theorist, uh, if you didn't guess that already, with a history of filing bizarre, frivolous lawsuits, like in 2007, when he sued then-President George W. Bush and Vice President Dick Cheney for conspiring with, quote, fellow demons to have Roller murdered with an explosive device at a Red Lobster. In Roller's complaint, he graciously gives Copperfield a way out of the litigation uh, to reveal his magician secrets that prove Copperfield's uh, tricks slash illusions are done conventionally and without godly powers. But Roller lamented that he has, quote, politely asked David via email to show how his tricks are done with no response. I guess Mr. Copperfield just doesn't have time for Roller's tricks. I don't have time for your magic tricks. Illusions, Dad. You don't have time for my illusions. What? Now, Roller, who has never worked for Copperfield in any capacity, claimed the magician had violated Minnesota labor law by stealing his magic, thus entitling Roller to a modest $50 million, 10% of all past slash future career earnings. And in 2006, the Minnesota court uh, summarily dismissed Roller's case for failure to state a claim. But believe it or not, Roller's saga against David Copperfield actually gets weirder. Uh, in June of 2005, Roller attempted to patent his magic powers. In his patent application, Roller refers to himself as a, quote, godly entity who seeks the exclusive right to the ethical use and financial gain in the use of godly powers on planet Earth. Roller then sued David Copperfield again in federal court, this time for patent infringement. And while a motion to dismiss the case was pending, Roller filed an amended complaint alleging that Copperfield and at least three other defendants were engaged in a conspiracy to murder him. So in November 2007, the federal court again dismissed Roller's claim with prejudice and barred the vexatious litigant from ever suing Copperfield again. And here's a pro tip. Even if you had godly powers, that would not entitle you to a patent on those godly powers, which, by the way, would uh, expire after 17 years. So, uh, you know, I, I'm getting that this guy has not put everything together. Uh, but the court dismissed the patent infringement claim on the grounds that the patent actually had not been granted, and thus Roller had no patent rights that could be infringed. The court also found that there were zero facts to support the claim that Copperfield was involved in a murderous conspiracy against Roller. And to add insult to injury, in 2008, the US Patent and Trademark Office rejected Roller's patent, writing, quote, the specification has not described how one of ordinary skill in the art could make or use the claimed godly powers. And in a near identical lawsuit filed in June 2005, Roller sued magician David Blaine for $2 million, accusing the magician of stealing Roller's godly powers to perform his magic. Are you sure you didn't buy a teddy bear? <laughs> yes, I'm sure I didn't. Yeah. Teddy bear, what, what the, the F? F? How did you? But the court dismissed that lawsuit as well due to Roller's failure to serve Mr. Blaine with the complaint. And that's the thing about trying to sue a magician. They'll just disappear on you. But that takes us to the lawsuit of the Oregon man who filed a billion dollar lawsuit because Michael Jordan sorta kinda maybe looks like him. Now, as you probably know, few people have embodied the greatness of sports like basketball superstar and popular meme template, Michael Jordan. As the iconic basketball player who earned six championship rings with the Chicago Bulls and nabbed a starring role in the critically unclaimed Space Jam, many have credited uh, MJ as the true goat of the NBA. It's just funny because I don't remember Jordan winning championships with two different teams. 
Contrary to the iconic 90s Gatorade commercial, not everyone wanted to be like Mike, especially not Portland, Oregon resident Alan Heckard, who claimed that his life had been completely ruined after being mistaken for the basketball champion nearly every day for 15 years and argued to an actual court of law that Michael Jordan and Nike owed him nearly $1 billion for his horrific injustice. Because America. In 2006, Heckard sued Michael Jordan for $416 million, arguing that the Space Jam star was liable to Heckard for emotional pain and suffering, defamation, and permanent injury. Heckard, acting as his own attorney, I probably don't need to tell you, alleged the following in the complaint, quote, Whatever public functions he attends, people are continually, on a daily basis, harassing him of looking like Michael Jordan. These unpleasant feelings from the public have troubled Heckard's nerves and denied him the right to a peace of mind. Uh, hashtag, uh, you have no legal right to that peace of mind. Now, Heckard also sued Nike founder Phil Knight for $416 million as well, writing in the complaint that Knight, quote, contributed to turning Michael Jordan into a legend which forced Heckard to change his appearance. In interviews, Heckard asserted the resemblance to Michael Jordan was so powerful that he would frequently draw crowds of disappointed Jordan fans whenever he went to church or played basketball in the park. Quote, it's making life uncomfortable. I'm constantly being harassed. I should be able to enjoy my own life, but everywhere I go, people tell me I look exactly like him. Now, Heckard arguably bears some resemblance to MJ with a shaved head and earring on his left ear uh, and similar conditioning from playing amateur basketball. But it should also be noted that the 51 year old shuttle bus driver is eight years older than Michael Jordan uh, and at uh, six feet tall stands a full six inches shorter than the six time NBA champion. Uh, and in this lawyer's opinion, the gentleman from Portland should be flattered that anyone should mistake him for Michael friggin Jordan uh, on the basketball court. Uh, but Hecker did not find the comparison complimentary at all. Now, when asked how he arrived at the damages amount of 416 million, Hecker told the media, quote, well, you figure with my age and you multiply that times seven and uh, then I turn around and I uh, figure that's what it all boils down to. Uh, yeah, so that's not how calculating damages works. Uh, or for that matter, uh, math. Uh, but you don't need a law degree to understand why no lawyer agreed to take such a patently frivolous defamation case. To assert a claim for defamation, a plaintiff has to show that the defendant made a false statement of fact about the plaintiff to a third party, and this false statement caused harm to the plaintiff. Now, I probably don't need to tell you that being repeatedly confused for celebrity does not come close to being defamatory, especially when there's no evidence anyone did anything to propagate the falsehood. And it's not even a falsehood. It's like when people say that I look like Ryan Reynolds or John Krasinski. That's whatever the opposite of defamation is. Uh, now, when people say I look like a Disney character or a dad from a Pixar movie, that is defamation. I don't know where this disrespectful attitude came from. But Hecker doesn't allege that Michael Jordan or Nike falsely claimed that Hecker is Michael Jordan. So this is not defamation. The complaint, much like Hecker's damages calculation, is essentially just the underpants gnomes of lawsuit. You see, phase one, collect underpants. Phase two, phase three, profit. Oh, I get it. Now, weeks later, Heckard would spare the legal system and further drama by withdrawing the lawsuit without explanation. But the explanation is it was a frivolous lawsuit. But that takes us to the firefighter who was afraid to enter burning buildings for fear of fire. Now, when pollsters ask people to name the most trusted and admired professions, you'll often find firefighters at the top of the list. Perhaps it's because they're like police, but they don't have a gun with which to kill you. Uh, but who doesn't love firefighters? When they aren't saving cats from trees or posing for hunky calendars, firefighters are famous for charging into burning buildings to rescue those in harm's way. But one Texas firefighter tried to claim that his fear of charging into burning buildings was equivalent to a legal disability and his removal from the front lines was uh, illegal disability discrimination. Spoiler, uh, he lost. Enter Shane Proler, a captain of the Houston Fire Department, leader of a fire suppression crew who had one teeny tiny problem. 
he was afraid of fire. For example, in 2004, Proler arrived at the scene of a fire and was unable to enter the building. In 2006, during a house fire, Proler was so frightened that he was unable to put on his firefighting gear, take orders, or even walk properly. A doctor determined Proler experienced a temporary memory loss called global transient amnesia. The city then reassigned Proler to Firefighting Training Academy. Proler responded by filing a successful administrative appeal, after which he was returned to the fire suppression crew. And when the city took it to trial, Proler filed a counterclaim arguing that his reassignment violated laws against disability discrimination. Proler did not claim he was disabled, just that the city of Houston perceived him to be disabled, making his reassignment a violation of state and federal anti-discrimination laws. The jury agreed, awarding Proler $362,000 in damages. The case was appealed all the way to the Texas Supreme Court, which threw out the jury verdict. In the Supreme Court's opinion, the court highlighted that anti-disability laws do not protect every person who wants a job, but who lacks the mental, physical, or experiential skill to perform that particular job. To illustrate the point, the court argued that lacking the skills to play for the San Antonio Spurs does not mean a person is disabled. Accordingly, the court concluded that there was not a scintilla of evidence that the fearful fire captain was disabled. Uh, Proler then argued that even if he was not disabled, the city perceived him as such and thus is liable for taking an adverse employment action, namely by reassigning him, based on the perceived disability. The court rejected this argument that there was no basis for classifying Proler's fear as a disability. A disability was defined as being regarded as having a mental or physical impairment that substantially limits at least one major life activity. And major life activity refers to basic functions uh, like taking care of yourself, walking, seeing, thinking, and breathing. Uh, now, under these definitions, the court held that there was no disability discrimination against the fearful firemen because, quote, fighting fires is not a major life activity. The court also found that Proler's fear of entering burning buildings was not a disability to be discriminated against, uh, noting, quote, a reluctance to charge into a burning building is not a mental impairment at all. It's the normal human response such a reluctance cannot be characterized as an impairment, much less an impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. But if you're bitter over that lawsuit, that's nothing compared to the bitterness that a certain Austin resident felt for a date who texted during a movie and for whom he sued for $17.31. Now, when it comes to finding love, there's nothing more exhilarating and nerve wracking than the first date. The excitement and promise of a lasting connection, tempered by the dread that this will end in disappointment like all others, or end in a lawsuit against you for texting. But that's exactly what happened when Brandon Vesmer turned a dispute over a date texting during a movie into a legal dispute by suing her for $17.31. The cost of the movie, here's what happened. In May of 2017, 37-year-old Vesmer took a 35-year-old woman, who I'm just gonna call uh, Nola Exit, to see Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 in 3D in Austin, Texas. Everything was going fine until Miss Exit began to text. Uh, the way that uh, Vesmer put it, uh, quote, it was kind of a first date from hell. This is like one of my biggest pet peeves. Yes, I'm sure that it was just horrible for him and this poor woman was having the time of her life and was being completely inconsiderate. Now, after suggesting that Miss Exit step outside to text when she refused to stop, uh, she then left the theater and never came back, leaving Vesmer to find his own ride because yeah, that checks out. Now, according to text messages posted on his now defunct Twitter account, Vesmer demanded that she pay $17 for the movie ticket and $4 for the slice of pizza that he bought her or else he would take her to small claims court. Uh, Miss Exit likely assumed that this was an empty threat. I mean, who would haul someone into small claims court over a bogus $20 claim, but apparently that person was none other than her date, Brandon Vesmer. In his petition, Vesmer alleged that Miss Exit used her phone to read and send text messages at least 10 to 20 times in 15 minutes, in direct violation of the theater's policy, adversely affecting the viewing experience of plaintiff and others. Uh, Vesmer asked the court for $17.31 in compensation for defendant movie ticket, dropping his initial $4 demand for the pizza. Uh, he closed his petition in dramatic fashion, writing, quote, while damages sought are modest, the principle is important as defendant's behavior is a threat to civilized society. So you can save civilized society for $17.31? 
that's kind of a bargain when you put it that way. Now the story immediately went viral with the AV Club calling him a hero and Guardians director James Gunn cheekily suggesting that Vesmer's date deserved jail time. But not everyone was cheering, let's go Brandon, especially the poor woman who went on this date. When the Austin American statesman informed uh, her about the lawsuit, she replied, oh my God, this is crazy. She then disputed Vesmer's claim that she texted 10 to 15 times saying she only sent uh, two texts to a friend uh, in a fight with her boyfriend and kept her phone low to ensure no one was disturbed. She then issued a statement to a local news station, quote, I did have a very brief date with Brandon that I chose to end prematurely. His behavior made me extremely uncomfortable and I felt I needed to remove myself from the situation for my own safety. He has escalated the situation far past what any mentally healthy person would. I feel sorry that I hurt his feelings badly enough that he felt he needed to commit so much time and effort into seeking revenge. I hope one day he can move past this and find peace in his life. Yeah, why am I not surprised that this guy completely misread the situation? Uh, I guess it might've been a tip off that he filed a lawsuit that had no legal merit whatsoever, purely out of spite. I guess that, yeah, that probably should have tipped me off to that. Now, this matter was finally settled in a sense, thanks to Inside Edition, who arranged for the pair to meet outside the original movie theater because, you know, that worked the first time. Uh, she ended up paying this guy $17.31, telling him, quote, the date just didn't work out, just leave this alone. And while Vesmer did drop the suit, he stands by his conduct. Let's count it, right? Just to make sure it's all here. 10, 15, 16, 17, 31 cents. And Vesmer issued a statement that uh, he wanted people to quote, treat other people with respect and dignity. Uh, exactly the kind of respect and dignity that is not commensurate with filing a bullshit lawsuit out of revenge. Sorry, Brandon. It's settled. <laughs> Now, if you'd like to see even more dumb criminals and terrible lawyers, check out my new exclusive video, Too Hot for YouTube. But I'm sorry to tell you, it's too hot for YouTube. So to see that exclusive video, you'll have to head over to today's sponsors, Nebula and Curiosity Stream. Because on Nebula, my videos always come out early with zero ads, and I release exclusive content all the time, like an entire video about legal stories that are not safe for work and too hot for YouTube. As well as exclusive videos like things people misunderstand about the Constitution, why NFTs are bad for creators, and my first full-length documentary, Bad Law Words Good, and tons more. All exclusive to Nebula. And all of this exclusive content is available only on Nebula, which you can get for free with Curiosity Stream. Because Nebula is creator owned and creator operated. There's new exclusive content released multiple times every day. And by the way, we've been developing Nebula like crazy. Nebula now has apps for iOS, Android, Apple TV, Roku, Fire TV, and Android TV. And it was recently nominated for its first Streamy Award. My fellow creators and I really care about Nebula and we're thrilled to be partnering with Curiosity Stream because they're the go-to source for the best documentaries and long form educational content on the internet. And they even have an entire section devoted to unsolved mysteries and crimes. So if you like my videos, you'll love the thousands of titles on Curiosity Stream. Now, the best way to get access to Nebula and all of this incredible content is through the amazing Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle deal with its current sales price of less than $15 per year to get full access to both sites. And to be clear, that Nebula subscription is on trial. It's free for as long as you're a Curiosity Stream member. There just isn't a better deal in streaming where you get access to two great streaming sites with content that you'll actually watch and enjoy, all for less than $15 per year at the current sales price. So sign up now by clicking on the button that's on screen right now, or you can click on the link that's down below in the description. It's a great way to support educational content and get tons of exclusive content that you'll love. So click on the link below right now. And after that, click on this playlist over here for more Legal Eagle, or I'll see you in court.